Next speaker is Claire Chan. She's going to speak on how to manage the most challenging uh, disease, which is the ocular cicatricial diseases. Thank you for the invitation to speak today. These are my financial disclosures. So we'll start with this photo, 65-year-old female with conjunctival cicatricial changes. She's been referred for shortened fornices and trochiasis. Uh, and on consult lamp exam, we see this area of conjunctival scarring and some early subepithelial fibrosis beginning. So we've heard already the importance of the conjunctiva. You can tell when the conjunctiva and the eye is inflamed, it is red. And the goblet cells are very important as a hallmark of conjunctival tissue, and that is what's key in the diagnosis for limbal stem cell deficiency. Uh, we've seen and heard already what can be sequelae of conjunctival inflammation, including limbal stem cell disease, the subsequent loss of goblet cells, and then essentially mucin deficiency, and then that leads to the symblephra formation. You lose the fornices, and the end-stage surface keratinization really is the end, um, and there's very difficult options at this point. Um, in terms of sequelae of the limbal stem cell disease deficiency, you see the late staining pattern, the conjunctivalizations, and the symptoms which Friedrich has described nicely already. In terms of staging, the new staging that was published most recently is great for helping to determine what intervention to offer the patients. However, I still find that the Holland classification described in 2002 is very good for prognosticating. And so patients who have inflamed conjunctiva that's active, as well as greater than 50% limbal stem cell disease, these ones really have the worst prognosis. Oftentimes, unfortunately, they may be also neurotrophic, and therefore, you know, any intervention uh, really has a poor prognosis. However, we still try. Uh, with the differential, uh, it's important to take a good history. Uh, preservatives, glaucoma drops, you really want to eliminate. Past medical history of ATP, graft versus host disease, Siemens-Johnson, these can all uh, create cicatricial changes on the ocular surface. A history of infections, trauma, and inflammation, especially if there's a refractory blepharitis that's been treated on and on and on many years. Think mucous membrane pemphigoid with ocular involvement. So in staging the disease, often at stage one, this is when people don't really know that it is MMP and it's just treated as blepharitis. Stage two, this is often when we'll do a biopsy because something abnormal is noted. Stage three, some blepharitis have formed already and stage four, unfortunately, the keratinization has occurred. This is the ocular surface optimization toolbox and unfortunately these patients often need something in every category um, in the short term and long term and often indefinitely if you're going to do an intervention. Um, and these have been described nicely in talks earlier today already. So in terms of managing our cicatricial ocular patients, um, glaucoma, number one, needs to be optimized, placing a tube shunt early on if possible, if there's good conjunctiva or CPC, and then really avoiding the toxicities from glaucoma medications and preservatives. Step two, you want to correct any lid abnormalities. Uh, you can see this is a multidisciplinary effort to help these patients. Uh, if any of these aspects are uncorrected, really it's a very poor prognosis for any reconstruction efforts because the eyelashes will just scrape the surface and ruin it. Any exposure will dry it out and it'll be ruined. Uh, keratinized lid margins even will scratch on the eye surface. Um, and any lag ophthalmosis while well leading to exposure needs to be corrected. Step three, any inflammation on the ocular surface, any autoimmune response, it's very important that that is suppressed as well. Um, so you can do that topically or systemically, and this can take months to even years. Uh, we found that especially in our chemical injury patients, those who had their chemical injury like five to 10 years ago and then undergo reconstruction, they do much better because the ocular surface has had a chance to really quiet down. Uh, in terms of step four, Scleral contact lenses have really revolutionized how I manage these patients. Often this is where we can actually stop and not need to go on. Um, so the two most common ones that I currently use is the PROS device, which we've heard about, and then also an impression molded iPrint Pro lens, which uh, we published the first series on, and it's a nice uh, molded device that actually fits onto the eye surface, kind of like when you got braces and you had to have that putty in your mouth to get the teeth mold. Um, so this then goes to 3D printing and then the device is actually made and it ends up looking like a scleral contact lens. And you wouldn't be able to believe that this patient with Stevens Johnson, of course they're monocular, of course they're only 21 years old, um, he could achieve best corrective vision of 2030. And so we did not need to have stem cell transplantation done, he did not need to be exposed to systemic immunosuppression, and he's been like this so far under my care for the last 10 years, so hopefully, fingers crossed, he can continue like this. 
Step five is finally now ocular surface stem cell transplantation, where you can then replace either conjunctiva, replace the stem cells. Uh, at this point, when you're doing the 360 conjuritomy, you can release any some blephron or ankyloblephron. Um, the fornix reformation is really important because then they can wear their protective contact lens. And then certainly K-Pro type one, if there are contraindications to systemic immunosuppression. Just to review briefly the types of stem cell transplants uh, available, there's conjunctival limbal allografts um, or autografts, uh, and these are more for the mild to moderate cases. Uh, you have your keratolimbal limbal allograft, which is using cadaver donor tissue. Here you do get nice 100% 360 limbus coverage, um, which is nice barrier to uh, conjunctivalization. These are more for our moderate to severe cases, um, if there's no live donor willing or available. Um, and Basically, the segments are secured with glue, sutures, contact lenses replaced, and usually we see them re-epithelialize over the course of sort of two weeks to two months. Uh, there's combination procedures that are possible. We can see there's live tissue at the 12 and 6 o'clock and then 9 and 3 o'clock using cadaver tissue. Once again, that gives us a bit more goblet cell replenishing as well as limbal stem cell 360 barrier. And then you can go ahead and then do step 6, which is then your optical corneal transplantation. And usually we try to do DULC, then PKP, and then K-Pro type 1 if transplants fail, and then type 2 uh, we refer those out if uh, K-Pro type 1 fails. And of course, needing ongoing surveillance forever for all the myriad of complications that can arise. So I just wanted to review a few pearls from clinical cases that I've seen. This was a 73-year-old female with unilateral symblephron formation over three months and referred in to rule out uh, MMP and pathology came back as squamous cell carcinoma. So always important to think about that in the back of your mind when you see acute symblephron forming. 52-year-old female with symblephron after EKC, bad adenoviral attack, complained of binocular dipopia with side gaze after optimization of her dry eye. Um, once the eye was quieted, we could free up the symblephron, um, secure an amniotic membrane graft into the defect and the fornix, and really we're just trying to use that as a spacer to allow the natural, normal conjunctival reepithelialization to occur before symblephra reforms. This is a nice paper describing the same KLAL technique that I showed in the video, except using smaller segments, and this is for mechanical or iatrogenic trauma where some blephron are created. Um, so tree branch injuries, blepharoplasty surgery gone awry, orbital floor fractures gone awry, um, post-mitomycin C treatment for squamous cell surface tumors, things like that, um, have worked really nicely using this technique. This was a 67-year-old female who had symblephron after her left eye cataract surgery. She complained of pain developing in the weeks after normal routine surgery. On review of systems, she had a 20-pound weight loss, fatigue, severe weight weakness. Severe, uh, recent CBC was grossly abnormal. And bone marrow biopsy was abnormal, came back as myelofibrosis, which is a form of chronic uh, leukemia. And so her diagnosis was an entity called perineoplastic pemphigus, first described in 1990, probably only about 18, 20 case reports in the literature. And essentially, you need to treat the malignancy um, and then also immunosuppress. And sometimes those don't go well together in terms of goals. Unfortunately, she passed away a few months after this already. Um, the review paper uh, listed is quite nice. It's free access, um, looking at sort of the different um, entities. So take-home points, a stepwise approach with a multidisciplinary team is needed for ocular surface reconstruction in ocular cicatricial diseases. A therapeutic scleral contact lens can delay or obviate the need for surgical intervention. And biopsy any acute symblephron that you see to rule out squamous cell carcinoma and mucous membrane pemphigoid. And MMP can be a perineoplastic manifestation, so keep that in mind as well. Thank you.